SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, thrives in the lungs. And that's part of the problem. Now, we know the virus is primarily transferred through the air. We also know the virus naturally decays when it's in the air. But why is that? It's kind of strange to be thinking about because the virus is carried on aerosol that is exhaled from your lungs. And that aerosol is made up of respiratory fluids. And as mentioned earlier, the virus thrives in respiratory fluids. So what's happening? There are two questions that we've been trying, a group of us at the University of Bristol have been trying to, to answer. One is, what is happening within the aerosol to change the cause of the virus to decay while it's in the air? And two, how can we use this information to help mitigate disease transmission? The body is filled with dissolved CO2 in the form of bicarbonate. It's a byproduct of metabolism. Additionally, the body uses this dissolved CO2 to buffer the pH of respiratory fluids. The way this works is bicarbonate reacts with acid to form carbonic acid, which itself will then break down to form CO2 in water. Now in solution, the CO2 will equilibrate with the CO2 in the gas phase. And so what this means is that the concentration of CO2 in the air will directly affect the pH in the water via this mechanism. So in short, as you increase the CO2 concentration in the air, you increase the acid content in the water. Now, in the lungs, you have a very high concentration of CO2, but that's coupled with a neutral pH of the respiratory fluids. And so what this means is when this aerosol is exhaled into a low concentration of CO2, the CO2 within the droplet will evaporate, and in doing so, increase the pH of the droplet, and over time, the pH of the droplet will reach will be somewhere around 10, 10 and a half, and this takes about a minute or two to occur. Now, if the concentration of CO2 in the air were to increase, say to something like 1,000 ppm, the amount of CO2 that leaves the droplet is lessened, and as a result, the pH of the droplet doesn't reach as high of a pH. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters because the rate in which the virus is decayed is driven and affected by the pH of the droplet itself. And so as you increase the CO2 concentration, you're going to neutralize the droplet more, and as a result, the decay rate of the virus in the droplet is going to be slower. So for context, in our previous study, we found that in clean air, about 98% of the viral load is inactivated in about 40 minutes. Now, in our current study, we're showing that eight, just 800 ppm CO2 is enough to affect how long the virus decays. That is not a lot of excess CO2. All right, so when we set the CO2 concentration to 3,000 ppm, that's a level that's you know, commonly found in poorly ventilated spaces, things like elementary schools, that kind of thing. Um, when the CO2 is at that high of a level, we found a fundamental change in the viral decay uh, in the aerosol, such that the final 30% of the viral load essentially like stopped decaying. And so what this means is that under these conditions, the aerosolized viral load will just accumulate. And the knock-on effect of this is a dramatic increase in the risk of transmission. There are a lot of implications with linking CO2 concentrations with viral decay. Uh, first off, it demonstrates the importance of air quality when it comes to disease transmission. So the pH of the air itself matters. The more acid in the air, like CO2, the higher the likelihood of disease transmission. And so second, it demonstrates the utility of ventilation in helping to mitigate the disease transmission. So if you think about those CO2 monitors that have become very popular over the course of COVID-19, um, they're great indicators of basically overall ventilation, indicator of like how many people are in a room, how many people are breathing, the likelihood of a virus being in the air. But what our work is showing is that they're actually doing a bit more than that. They're actually giving you an indication of essentially how well the virus itself is surviving in the air. And lastly, this work is mechanistically connecting the driver of climate change, so elevated CO2 levels, with how long the virus itself remains infectious in the air. And so the knock-on effect of this is that essentially we're losing how well ventilation can drive the loss of viral infectivity indoors. We're essentially losing this, our ability to exploit this natural mechanism of viral decay. 
And so it's, it's, it's a real problem.